Can I lift a car using batteries? Power my entire shop? Power my house in a service outage? Charge a Tesla Plaid? We'll try all that and more as we put a pair of EcoFlow Delta Pros to the test. All right here today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to have some fun experimenting with a pair of EcoFlow Delta Flow portable power stations. Why a pair? Because when tied together with the optional hub, they produce a full 240 volts of AC power, which in theory allows me to not only power 240 devices like my shop lift, but also to use it as a whole house battery backup solution. Before we even look at the batteries, let's jump right on in and see if we can weld steel with them. I'll connect the two Delta Pros together into a 240 volt source. More about how that's done in a minute, and then I'll plug my welder into that. This welder is a Lincoln 175 amp MIG, and we'll run it up there in steps, starting with one quarter power. As soon as I blow the dust and spiders out of my helmet, looks like it's been a long time since I did any welding, apparently. I'll try to run a bead and see if the batteries can supply enough juice to power it properly. And sure enough, at a one quarter power, it has absolutely no problem laying down a quality bead. So I'm watching this, like you, while I'm editing it, that I realize... Dave, why are you welding over top of a flammable dog bed? And would it kill you to throw a welding blanket on top of the uh, battery packs you've got next to you? So, yeah, not a safety video. Make sure you follow all appropriate safety measures. Let's check my weld quality to see how I did. Yeah, that looks pretty good, Dave. That's pretty nice for MIG. We'll dial up the welder to half the maximum power and give it another try. And this time, just like last time, it still has absolutely no problem. According to the meters on the machines, we're putting about 4,000 watts out at the moment, so this is far more than you could do with a 120 volt welder or with a single battery pack. Next, I'll step it up to three quarter power, since that's the highest I've ever found actual reason to take this welder. This setting is appropriate for welding shackle mounts onto a truck frame, so if we can do that, I'd say the Delta Pros are ready for work on the pipeline. And sure enough, the batteries don't even flinch and the breaker doesn't pop as they turn out another tasty piece of practice metal. And with that, I'd call this part a win. Let's take a moment to meet the Delta Pros. Each one sports a max power delivery of 4,500 watts in X-Boost mode with a nominal output of 3,600 watts and a capacity of 3,600 watt hours. You can also add extra batteries to bring your total all the way up to 25,000 watt hours. When two of them are tied together as a pair, they support 7,200 watts at 240 volts with a capacity of 7,200 watt hours. That's more than the portable gas generator that I used to use to power my breaker panel during power outages, and we'll put that scenario to the test as well. Can it run the lights and appliances in the house with the mains disconnected? We'll find out. I have these Delta Pros connected to my solar roof system, which means everything we're doing here today is going to be fully solar powered. It's like sunshine in a box. Whole home power seems to be the feature that EcoFlow is most proud of, but it wouldn't be Dave's garage if we didn't test some really weird stuff as well. To that end, then, I'm going to see if I can lift my car on a big hydroelectric shop lift, my Mohawk A7. Next, we'll plug them into my house's transfer switch and see if we can run the entire panel. Finally, we'll see if we can get it to recharge my wife's Tesla Plaid from its batteries. It's got the power to do it, but Teslas are notoriously picky about the power signal and its configuration, so we'll see if it throws the car for a loop or not. Before we risk blowing anything up, we should quickly revisit how the power grid works, at least here in North America. Your house has three wires coming in, which represent two phases of power plus a neutral that they're referenced against. Your breaker panel is also grounded, and I think the whole neutral versus ground thing is confusing for some folks, so let's try to clear that up. In household AC power delivery, neutral and ground are two separate and distinct conductors that serve different purposes, although both are essential for electrical safety. The neutral wire is a current carrying conductor that serves as the return path for electrical current in a circuit. It is usually connected to the center tap of the transformer, out in your back alley, which supplies power to the building. In a typical single phase AC system, the neutral wire completes the circuit by connecting the load back to that transformer. The neutral wire is typically identified by being white or light gray insulation. The ground wire, on the other hand, is a safety conductor that provides an alternative path for electrical current to flow in case a fault or short circuit occurs. It is connected to the earth or ground, which acts as a large reservoir of electrons. The ground wire is not meant to carry the current under normal circumstances, but it can carry current in case of a fault to prevent dangerous voltage levels from building up in the actual equipment. This helps protect people from electric shock and prevent damage to appliances and other equipment. The ground wire is typically identified by green or green-yellow insulation. 
In a typical North American household, the power supplied is a single-phase 240-volt system. The system is derived from a center tap transformer which provides two 120-volt legs. These two legs can be used individually to supply 120-volt circuits or combined to supply a 240-volt circuit. And here's how it works. The power utility supplies electricity to your home using a distribution transformer, typically mounted on a pole or located in a ground-level box. This transformer has a center tap secondary winding that divides the voltage into two equal halves. The center tap of the transformer is connected to the neutral wire, which serves as the return path for electric current in the circuit. The two ends of the secondary winding are connected to the hot wires, which create two 120 volt legs. Each leg has a voltage of 120 relative to the neutral wire. These two legs supply power to the majority of household circuits, such as lighting, outlets, and small appliances. Now to create a 240 volt circuit, both 120 volt legs are used together. Instead of using the neutral wire as a return path, the two hot wires are connected to the load, one from each leg. Since the two legs are 180 degrees out of phase with each other, the voltage differential between the hot wires adds up to 240 volts at peak. This is called a double pole or two pole circuit, and it is used to power large appliances such as electric ranges, air conditioners, water heaters, and clothes dryers. Let's jump right into things by trying to lift my car. The first thing I did was to carefully back my car onto the lift. This car is no lightweight, tripping the scales at over 4,800 pounds. The lift is powered by a hydraulic pump that is spun by a large 240 volt electric motor that is rated at a nominal 12 amps. On paper, that's just under 3,000 watts, so it should be well within the limits of the Delta Pros. The problem, however, is that the ratings you'll see on most every type of electric motor are for once the motor is up to speed. There's a second rating, which is often not displayed on the motor sticker, called Locked Rotor Amps. That's the load that the motor will pull briefly when starting up from a standstill or if you somehow held it stationary, and it can be several times the running amperage. If that spike is, let's say, 40 amps, then we're going to be demanding almost 10,000 watts at peak when we hit the button the first time. That's outside the range of what the Delta Pros can supply. Unlike a mechanical generator, there's no flywheel from which it can momentarily steal the momentum as potential energy. So to be honest, I'm not sure how it's going to handle it, and there's only one way to find out. The first thing I need to do is to bring the units close enough to the lift to plug the lift into the 240 volt voltage hub. At about 90 to 100 pounds each, these are heavy batteries, but fortunately they're equipped not only with wheels, but also with a very handy telescoping lift handle. You simply pop the handle out and extend it from under the machine. Now according to Archimedes, with a long enough lever and a place to stand, you can move pretty much anything, and the Delta Pros are no exception. Moving them around by pulling the extension handle it actually makes them pretty easy to move around. Once I get over by the lift, I can use the voltage hub and the included 240 volt NEMA twist lock extension cord to interconnect the battery supplies and the 240 volts go to the lift. We should talk for a moment about how the units cooperate to supply 240 volts because it's not like you can take any two inverters and just connect them to make 240 volts. Each Delta Pro nominally only makes 120 volts in a sine wave pattern. With the hub connected, two things must be happening. First, the 220 volt supplies must be interconnected to form a single 240 volt supply. But for that to work, the two inverters in the battery packs have to work in concert, meaning that they need to synchronize their sine waves to perfectly so that they are 180 degrees out of phase with one another. We need the peaks to be directly opposed to one another to create that 240 volt potential. And the Delta Pros, when connected by the hub, contain the required circuitry and logic to make that happen. I got everything set up then, and I'm rather embarrassed to say I got stuck. I couldn't figure out how to turn the thing on. I scratched my head for a good hour reading manuals and searching the web until I finally read mention of a breaker switch on the voltage hub itself. It's on the top of the unit, completely unmarked and easy to miss. So if you've got the 240 volt hub and can't figure out how to get power out of it, let me save you some time and frustration. The tiny little membrane push switch is on the top edge of the voltage hub. I finally powered on the hub and checked the voltage with a test meter to confirm that I had 240 volts and sure enough it seemed ready to go. One thing about this lift is that not only do I have to contend with the normal startup load of the inductive motor, but this lift gets really stiff when it hasn't been run for a while. I'm not sure if it's establishing prime on the pump or it just doesn't like to be cold started, but you can really hear it struggle for the first second or two, even on the AC line power. This time on battery was no exception, and as soon as I hit the button to raise the lift, it kicked the battery breaker out on the voltage hub. But it did run for that half second or so to get things started, so hoping against hope, I reset the breaker and tried again. This time even starting up from a complete stop was no problem and the lift dutifully began to raise. 
It operated at full speed and it sounded largely like it does when plugged into normal AC line power. The car came up promptly and I was able to cycle the lift up and down with the car fully loaded on it without any further issues. So despite taking two tries, the Delta Pro scored a win in the car lifting category. It was time to move on to whole house power in the Tesla. First, I rolled the batteries over to the corner of the garage in order to get them into position. Just like last time, I connected the voltage hub to tie the batteries together into a 240 volt setup and I connected a 25 foot extension cable. I've standardized most everything around my house that uses 240 volts to use the NEMA Twistlock 30 amp connector and that includes the generator supply input for one panel on the side of the garage. I ran the extension cord down and plugged it into the exterior outlet. You'll notice this is a weird in that the fact that the outlet is male and we're plugging a female cable into it. That's because we're going the opposite direction. We're not drawing power from the outlet, we're supplying power to the outlet. And so the outlet in this case is the male end. Now you might have seen various YouTubers doing crazy things like making double ended electrical male cables to be able to plug a generator into their dryer outlet to run their house. Just because you saw it on the internet does not mean it's a good idea and this is a prime example. For one thing, doing so creates a serious hazard in that the prongs on your illegal cable are hot at all times, meaning if you accidentally touch the prongs, let's hope you know how to play the harp because you're likely dead at that point. A second risk is that there's no physical interlock. Let's say you're in a power outage and you power your house through some backdoor shenanigans like this. There's nothing that prevents you from forgetting to turn off the mains and that means you could kill a lineman working out to repair the local outage. Your power could backfeed from your generator into the house and the main panel and then straight out into the hands of some poor guy out in a bucket truck. Just don't do it and that's all I have to say about that. To do it properly, you don't even need one of those fancy transfer switches with a bunch of toggle switches that allow you to select where each circuit draws its power from, the line or the generator. All you actually need is a dedicated input breaker on your panel that's accompanied by a physical interlock. As you can see here, my input circuit is in the very top right of the panel. There's a metal plate here that prevents both the main panel input from the utility and the generator supply from being active at the same time. You can turn on one or the other depending on which way you slide the plate, and as long as the plate is in place, you're prevented from accidentally or intentionally backfeeding power out to the utility during an outage or connecting the two live circuits together. Since your generator is going to be randomly phased relative to the AC power, I'm not even entirely sure what the consequences of doing so would be, but I can guarantee you that it's a bad idea. With the generator interlock set to disconnect the mains and tie the generator input power to the panel, both phases on the panel will now be hot, so breakers on either side of the circuit should work, as will double breakers that provide 240 volts by connecting both sides. Next, I plug the extension cord running from the house into the Delta Pro voltage hub and turn it on. Let's run into the house and see what works. Right away we can see that all the simple stuff, like the lighting, is working just fine. And unlike some mechanical generators I've used, there's no flickering or dimming, it's a pure sine wave source that's largely indistinguishable from AC utility power. Because I've switched to LEDs for most of my lighting, it's not even a big load on the batteries at this point. The lights in the ceiling are all well and good, but what about that most important of lights, the one inside the fridge? Well, let's open the fridge and find out. We have fridge. Sure enough, the fridge is running and the lights are on and my copious amounts of cold beverages are still chilling. Let's up the ante by turning on a clothes dryer and see what happens. Remember, I'm running all this on a 30 amp cable, so running the double oven is out of the question, but the dryer comes in at under 30 amps even though it uses a 50 amp outlet, so we should be okay. The dryer dutifully spins up and the EcoFlows are powering it without any complaints. At this point, I was pulling close to 4000 watts total, so the smart thing to do when you've got double dryers is to try them both. So I fired up a second dryer, briefly pulling almost 7000 watts combined, and it all still worked properly. Now the shop in Dave's garage out here is powered off a sub-panel that is connected to the panel in the house that we're working with, so in theory, once I've turned the dryers off, I should be able to power the entire switch circuit in the shop simply by turning on the breaker to the sub-panel. To test it out, let's flip the breaker to the shop and see what happens. Sure enough, the shop powers right up, and in a minute or so, the Wi-Fi LED lighting is also working as well, since the server rack is also being powered by the Delta Pros, and the Wi-Fi access points are all PoE. Much success. But will my luck last for the final test, which is to recharge the Tesla from these batteries? Let's find out. In order to plug in a Tesla, which has a 50 amp plug into our 30 amp cable, we need an evil adapter. Now caution must be exercised when doing this as you could overload the cable. We're protected by a current breaker and the most I've seen the Tesla pull is 32 amps, so we should be right on the ragged edge of practical. To make it work, I grabbed an adapter off Amazon that allows me to plug a dryer style 50 amp plug into a 30 amp NEMA twist lock. 
They're actually sold and intended for use on RVs, so it seems like there's a valid purpose for the adapter, but I'd never do it without the 30 amp breaker in the circuit to protect against too much current, and I wouldn't leave it unattended. Still, you should check with a qualified electrician or your local electrical code for any requirements or prohibitions before you attempt it. At this point, I've got the Tesla charger plugged into the adapter, the adapter plugged into the 240 volt hub, and the hub plugged into the Delta Pros. To fire it all off, I turn on the hub and then plug the Tesla into the cable and... Nothing. Doesn't pop the breaker, but the Tesla charge unit started flashing red, so it was clearly in some kind of air state. Checking the dashboard in the car, it reported insufficient grounding. I'm not even sure what this means in this case, but long story short, the Tesla was having none of it. In retrospect, I wonder if I might have had more luck if I'd run this test when the entire house was plugged into the Delta Pros, but unfortunately, the way my house is wired, the Tesla chargers aren't on the same panel, so direct connection was my only path to the batteries, and in this case, it just doesn't work. If you have a theory as to why that is, or what the insufficient grounding message is really trying to tell me, please let me know in the video comments. I'd love to hear your input. I've put links to the Delta Pros and the Voltage Hub in the video description. If you've enjoyed today's experiments or found the episode to be informative or entertaining, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. I'm just in this for the subs and likes, after all. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it, do it!